Welcome to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hemmerker. In each episode, she'll talk with your favorite romantic suspense authors. They will take you behind the scenes of the writing process, giving excerpts from their writing, and share stories about their writing life. Underground by Linda Shenton Matchett It's been six months since Ruth Brown followed clues to England and discovered the identity of her sister's killer. War continues to rage as Ruth reports on food shortages, the black market, evacuation of London's children, and the bravery of the British people. When a bombing raid destroys her home and unearths a 20-year-old skeleton in the cellar, her reporter's senses tingle in anticipation of solving another mystery. Unfortunately, the -the by-the-book detective inspector assigned to the case is not interested in her theories. As Ruth investigates the case on her own, she butts heads with the handsome policeman. Will she get to the bottom of the story before the killer strikes again? Hi, and welcome to this episode of The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm Sarah Hamaker, and I'm so glad you joined me. Today I have with me Linda Shenton Matchett. She uh, writes about ordinary people who did extraordinary things in days gone by. Um, She's a native of Baltimore. Uh, She is also um, a volunteer docent and archivist for the Wright Museum of World War II. And I think you're going to really enjoy our conversation about writing, um, more historical romantic suspense, but still... Uh, we got that romance and suspense in there. So welcome to the show, Linda. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks. So we were talking uh, before we started recording this about finding time to write. And I loved your, I loved how you thought about that. So, so I'm going to ask you the question and then you can tell me your answer again. Cause I thought, I think our listeners will really enjoy knowing this. So when do you find time to write Linda? This is probably my most favorite question, and I try not to jump on a soapbox, but I work a uh, 40-hour-plus-a-week job, and to me, the difference is actually making time to write, not finding time. And maybe that's my authorness coming out Mm -hmm. with being nitpicky about the difference in words, you know, finding versus making time. Um, Because to me, finding is you kind of stumble on it or, oh, look, now I have time you know, maybe I'll go quick and write. Whereas, whereas I am pretty intentional and very strategic about it as far as making the time, because if I don't, uh, the writing doesn't get done. But what I've also found, which is really interesting and something it never occurred to me would happen. And I, uh, I write every day. I have different things that I do. Like Sundays is my uh, social media day where I write blog posts and a variety of things like that. Saturday is some other stuff. Monday through Friday is when I work on my manuscripts. Um, And Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm at work by 8 o'clock, but I I live pretty close, so I don't need to leave until about quarter to 8. So I I am intentional. I set my alarm, and I am up and showered and at my desk at 6 a.m. Well, what I have found, and again, totally did not realize this would happen it's almost like muscle memory Mm. in that when i when my butt hits the chair okay it says oh you're at the desk it's six o'clock in the morning it's time to write and so i am i'm engaged almost immediately um and i think that also has to do with i've made the time i haven't kind of wandered into the room and said well gee i think i'll do some writing so that was an interesting um, something that happened when I started getting very intentional about my writing, which allows me to be more productive. And I'm not one of those people, I, I see some of these Facebook posts where people write thousands and thousands of words a day. Um, but before work, I can usually get at least 1,000 or 1,200 words in. And again, I think it's because I sit down and, and make the time. Yeah, and I think that that's so important, Linda, you know, making the time. Um, Because I, I mean, I work from home, so I can work all the time. (laughs) I can work all the time, which is a a blessing and a curse. That's a blessing, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it's a curse sometimes, too. So, um, you know, and I was kind of, I would have writing on my to-do list every day. And I was finding, 
I was I would save it to the end because it wasn't paying me, right? You know, it right. wasn't something, you know, I'm a freelance writer um, also, and so I'm like, well, if they're paying me, I got to get that done because if I don't get that done, I'm not getting paid. Um, and writing for myself um, before I have, you know, contracts or anything like that, it was just hard to work it in. And so until a year or so ago, I had, you know, a similar epiphany where I was like, you know what? I need to start my day with writing. And so, you know, four or five days a week, it just depends on on the schedule. You know, I don't even check email. The only thing I open is Word on my computer. And for an hour, that's all I do. Some days I can do it a little more, but some days I, you know, I try to get that hour in. And that's really helped a ton um, on that. So, again, making the time, prioritizing, and helping yourself. I think what I'm also hearing you say is that you're kind of helped yourself, you know, um, not be distracted by other things because you got all ready for work and then you write instead of, Writing in your pajamas and then having to scramble to get ready for work, for example. Right. And so, yes, it's and it's like a job. For, well, it is my job. You know, it's a second job. It's my career. So, yes. Um, and I do tend to be a pretty focused individual. So it wasn't hard for me to make that change. But, yeah, definitely get it all done so that, yes, then I look up and it's quarter to eight. And, okay, go get your coat, get in the car. Time to go. Well, I'm, I must admit, I mean, I live um, in the in northern Virginia, the, right outside of Washington, D.C., and the thought of leaving my house at quarter to eight and getting anywhere by eight is kind right. of um, I actually, my husband and I spent uh, about 25 years in northern Virginia. We yeah. were in Fairfax first and then Sterling, and yes, I my commute was 16 miles, and it took me 45 minutes. Yes, so, yeah. So yes, I thank my stars every day. <laughs> yes, I know, and I try. I'm trying and not to be I live jealous. Two miles from work, and it does only take five minutes. Because yeah, even in uh, Northern Virginia, two miles takes you know 15 minutes. Yes, I know, I know. Anyway, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not jealous anymore. We're going to focus on other things. So, <laughs> what is absolutely um, essential for you to write? Do you find a quiet space, a cup of tea, a coffee? What What do you really need besides you know getting yourself in the chair? Right. <laughs> um, I do have to have. Yeah. I write World War II fiction, and I tried. Um, I have a boombox, and I have a ton of World War II music. I love mm -hmm. listening to it. So I have a ton of CDs, um, and I also have a couple of YouTube channels that I listen to. But I found it was distracting because I, you know, I realized I was like singing along, and nothing was hitting the keyboard. So I um, so I was immersing myself in the era certainly, but then nothing was coming out. So it I'm definitely got to be quiet. And in fact, um, recently my husband was home ill, and so he was home. And I thought if he makes one more noise, I'm going to send him down to the basement. And he really <laughs> wasn't that noisy. <laughs> <laughs> but there was. You know, there were different noises in the house yeah. that were happening, and it, it it was pretty distracting. So I hate that I'm that um, inflexible, that I'm not able to to write if there are things going on. But unfortunately, that's, yeah, I need absolute pretty much peace and quiet. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I need, I need it to be pretty quiet, although I must say I have, I mean, I've written a lot um, when my kids were little and... So I did kind of learn that focus, but that was more nonfiction, so it wasn't, you know, and I did write some fiction, but I do like the quiet. I like to be able to kind of hear my thoughts, um, and I do hate to be interrupted. Right. Yeah, oh, somebody better be bleeding. <laughs> yes, I know. That's so true. So usually... I mean, I wish I could start writing earlier, but I usually can't start until about 8:30 because that's when all that's when all the kids are all out to school and sure, um, sure. yeah. Next year though, I'll have um, it's my last year of elementary school, so next year everyone will be out the door by 7:30. So I'm hoping to kind of next school year right. is coming in September, really kind of be right. ready at 7:30 and be able to write right. even you know a couple hours 
in the morning as right. opposed to one. Well, and so. I am definitely more productive in during morning hours. Um, I I went through a course where um, the instructor had you take 20-minute segments during different times of the day, mm. and I definitely find, I mean, I can write in the afternoon. I have X number of hours per week to focus on my writing career, so I, I do take the time, but I definitely can get more words down on a paper generally during my morning writing than my afternoon writing. So yeah. my brain just apparently is not as productive. And forget the evening writing for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Eight o'clock, my brain is just is just done. I mean, I can do some yeah. things, but you know, if it recalls right. any kind of creativity, I'm like, okay, I'm just I'm I'm just done with that. So I have to I have to stop. So I just yeah. 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 <laughs> I wish, and I hear these people who write like in the middle of the night, and I'm like, who are you? <laughs> I know. And what is that all about? I know. Yeah. I but don't my, understand. My husband it. is like that. He is definitely a night bird. Uh, he is a software engineer, and so he can be programming at like one thirty or 2 o'clock in the morning, and I think, wow, there's there's no way. There's absolutely no way. Yes, yeah. I know. I admire them. I do. But yes, I'm like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not those people. So uh, so what is yeah. your favorite um, favorite spot for reading or reflecting on your current work in progress? When you're not at the computer, when you, maybe you're reading a proof or just thinking about it, do you have a favorite favorite place you go to or a favorite thing you do? Um, I do. Um, we actually recently moved. Um, we downsized. We had a 4,000-square-foot house that we used to run as and breakfast, and then we closed the business and realized we did not need 4,000 square feet. So we relocated to a teeny-weeny little house that actually faces, it, it backs up to woods and forest, and it's just fabulous. And so there is a chair. I'm pointing like you can see me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Everyone re- think of Linda's <laughs> chair. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So I have a chair that looks out over, and in the summertime, it's fabulous Mm -hmm. because I have a deck and a chaise lounge. Um, But definitely it is any chair that's facing the woods, and I just find it incredibly uh, restful and rejuvenating, and and it allows me to, you know, I am reading the work and working on it, but then I look up and it it just kind of really fills me. And yes, and I absolutely love it. We were located, we used to be located on Main Street, and not mm. that we're in a big town, it's a little village, but there's enough traffic that it was intrusive. Backing right. up into the woods is just an absolute dream to come true. Yeah, I mean, we have, um, a couple of years ago, we put a covered back porch on, and um, it, you know, I'll go out and sit, you know, there. Um, it's a little chilly now, but. <laughs> <laughs> even in Northern Virginia, even though the weather is doing crazy things, like it always does in this time of year. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I go out, sit out there to kind of relax. Or we have a front porch, you know, with a swing that sometimes I'll go sit just to kind of get that fresh air and, and think about what to do and take my work out there sometimes, too. Because um, there is something about the nature that just kind of, you know, makes you feel feel calm and creative so yeah i agree i agree i don't i yeah, i don't know what it is but i agree i think it touches a part of us that allows that creativity flow mm-hmm. oh definitely well um we are out of time so uh, okay. almost out of time linda so is there anything else about your writing or your work um that you would like our listeners to know well um not sure if you have more readers or writers, um, but I really um, think when I first started, first I sat out and wrote the great American novel that turned out to be probably, it will never see the light of day, it's so <laughs> awful. But I, I sent it, you know, in my naivete, sent it to um, one of the big publishers, and believe it or not, the editor actually sat down and wrote me a fairly lengthy rejection letter that was both edifying and encouraging, which I was stunned to even get. She talked about what, you know, what I had done well, what needed work, and encouraged me. And the biggest thing she said was to just keep writing. Mm. And I think sometimes us writers get a little uh, stuck in imposter syndrome. You know, I'm not right. really a writer. I can't, you know, what? I'm not a writer. There's, 
and you, you start comparing yourself, and comparison is such a, you know, a joy kill. And so just keep writing, because there are readers out there who will love your work, and, you know, readers try new authors. That's something that I've started doing in the last year or so, and I have now authors who I follow just if you gaga, that, you know, I can't wait for something to come out, and I had never heard of them, but I'm part of a lot of Facebook reader groups, because yes, I'm an author, but I am an absolutely voracious reader. Oh, love yeah. to read. Love to read. And so just hunt around and try reading outside the genre that you think you only ever want to read, and you'll find some great, some great authors. That's great advice, um, you know, for any of us to, you know, to not to be afraid to take a chance um, on a new author or something that looks interesting. So, yes, I, I totally agree. So, well, thank you so much. This has been so much fun, Linda. Thank you for being on my show today. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Uh, you've been listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I've been talking to, with Linda Shenton Mashett, she writes about ordinary people who do extraordinary things in the days gone by. You can find out more about her and links how to connect with her, connected um, with this podcast, and look for her book, Undercover, which is out now. Now an excerpt from Underground by Linda Shenton Matchett. At the familiar whistle of a V-1 bomb, Ruth Brown dove under her bed praying this was not her day to die. Seconds later, the explosion tore away half the house, exposing the tiny room she shared with her best friend, Varys Gladstone, to the cold, damp dawn. A second hit, and the bed collapsed on top of her. Stunned, she lay under the debris. Bits of glass, wood, and plaster rained down upon the mattress and floor. Her ears rang, and dust filled her throat. Ruth! Varys's voice came from a distance. Where are you, Ruth? Footsteps thundered toward her, then the sweet release of pressure when the mattress was lifted away. Varys shoved the wooden bed slats aside and leaned close. Can you hear me? Are you all right? I thought I'd lost you. Tears streamed down her face. Ruth eased herself to a sitting position, wincing at the pain that peppered her body. Varys draped an arm around her shoulder. Can you stand? We should evacuate the house. It could fall at any moment. I, I think so. Ruth climbed to her feet and took an inventory of her injuries. Nothing seemed to be broken. She shivered and turned to her closet. Let me get a jacket. Then I need to find my typewriter. Varys frowned and shook her head. We need to leave now. It will just take a few minutes. We'll be fine. The bomb was probably a one-off. Some Jerry who got lost on his way home hadn't used all his armament. I'm not worried about more bombs. The house could collapse. Varys's trembling voice was scratchy. From dust or screaming, Ruth didn't know. Ruth had done some screaming herself. Even after living six months in London and experiencing the explosion in Ireland... She couldn't get used to the horror of a falling bomb with its high-pitched, ear-splitting whistle and the tearing sound it made as it rushed toward them from the sky. The ground shook and shuddered with the impact, followed by the crash of masonry as houses and buildings toppled. The pervasive smell of gas mingled with the ash from crackling fires. Shaking the memories from her mind, she rose. They picked their way through the ruins and out the front door that sagged on its hinges. I thought I could keep you safe if we lived outside the city, Varys. I knew the dangers when I chose to come to England. With a crooked grin, she gestured to the broken plaster, boards, and debris shrouding their belongings. Besides, who else would help you sort through this mess to find your precious Smith Corona? No one but you, that's for sure. Now, let's see what else we can salvage. Varys nodded. All right, but let's be quick about it. She turned to sort through a pile of rubble next to the couch. Ruth tackled the pieces of their broken dresser, searching for undergarments and socks for each of them. Fifteen minutes later, her fingertips were raw, 
and her back ached from moving dozens of bricks and countless pieces of wood scattered on top of their belongings. Weary to the bone, she leaned against the wall still standing. With a crack, the plaster gave way. Arms flailing, Ruth reached out for something, anything, to hold on to to prevent her from falling. Enveloped in fabric as she fell into a closet full of clothes and fought to breathe. Blindly, her fingers scrabbled for and then caught the first garment she could reach, but the item slid off its hanger, and she landed with a thud under a pile of blouses, skirts, and trousers. She coughed, and her ribs sharply protested. Bruised and aching, she shifted to take the weight off her hip. The floorboard snapped, and she plunged into a dank hole. Ruth! Ruth, are you all right? Where are you? I'm down here, under the floor. Something jabbed her in the back. Ouch! Bring a flashlight. I need to see how to get out of here. A murky ray of light cut through the darkness. Ruth screamed and leapt to her feet, brushing away the cobwebs that clung to her and a large human skeleton lying in pieces on the dirt. Several articles of clothing from the closet above were in a lump beside it. She shuddered and looked at Varys, who goggled at the pile of bones. Who could it be? Whoever it is has been down here a long time. Only his shoes are left. With a shaking hand, Varys pointed to the skeleton's legs that disappeared into the tops of crumbling black leather boots. Thanks for listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hammerker. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. You can sign up to receive notifications of upcoming podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammakerfiction.com.